feudal class structure in England in particular, and the origin of parliament in England. Um, and so this is where we start to start to really focus on England. But in the background, I want you to be thinking about, okay, the, the Protestant Reformation on the continent, uh, you know, apart from the island of England, but back on the mainland, uh, is going on at the same time. And so uh, feudal class structure, now this is just sort of, sort of thinking generally about this time period. Um, you know, some of this is holdovers from the old feudal order, but some of it is kind of new developments that are occurring as towns become more substantial and burgers, people living in towns become more significant within society. Um, okay, so at the highest level, we have the monarch. So the king or queen of England is uh, in a class unto themselves. However, in thinking in terms of class struggle and class warfare, this class also includes those in the line of succession. And we'll see that play out. And I'll try to draw the connections between these relationships. You know, these people are all part of the same families. I mean, extended family, right? Uh, and they protect their interests against everyone else very effectively. That what, that's what makes them on top. If they weren't fully conscious of the class war, then they would lose power. But they don't lose power because they are conducting war against everybody else in the society to make sure that they don't take the power. Okay, and then in the middle is the nobility, uh, you know, other than those in the line of succession, which sometimes they might be in the line of succession, they might fall out of the line of succession, depending on who's born and who gets married and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this middle level also contains high level clergy, like bishops. And, and so, uh, the bishops are considered, you know, nobility, and, and bishops often have a fiefdom, you know, so it's all tied into this way of thinking about things in a medieval sort of way. Uh, and then everybody else is commoners, and, and that's just everybody. So you have people in the countryside. If you don't have a noble title, even if you own land, if you have title to land, if you hold land in some form, you still were not nobility and were secondary to the nobles, to the true peerage, as they call them in England. So you might have wealthy landlords living off of rents. Um, and many of these people had social ties to nobility, that they were friends with them, or maybe distant relatives, not quite in there but close to it and and then they'd often try to marry the right person in order to get into the peerage to get into nobility and with enough wealth you can make that attractive for certain people okay and um and so you have some landed gentry people who in this time period are very wealthy but they're at the lowest stratum of society in terms of power You could have very wealthy people that are at the lowest stratum of society in terms of power. Uh, and that's kind of what the, the knights were facing back on the continent. <clears throat> um, in England, you have this notion of the yeoman uh, farmer, the yeoman free tenants. So these are people who are free. They're not serfs, even going back generations. Uh, and they, they, have, uh, they have some sort of holding in land, but they're probably paying rent in order to farm the land and farm it pretty much in the style of 
futile agricultural uh, production that I discussed earlier, uh, not a very efficient form of farming, just like like subsistence farming, just making you know enough produce to feed their family and maybe have a little bit extra here and there, but really struggling, uh, but they're free. And, and then they're paying rent largely to uh, their landlord, not paying in the form of wheat or pigs or whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> and they might have some other arrangement other than rent with their landlord. So there, there's each, each sort of agreement is negotiated separately. Then you have wage earners at this time, people who live off of wages. So they're getting paid just like we get paid today, um, especially for servants. Uh, you know, if you have uh, a landlord, um, some duke out in the countryside who has a big uh, mansion, that they're running, they're gonna have a lot of servants and those servants are gonna get paid in money. Right? That's how they're compensated. And then of course, there's still serfs that are working the land and, and um, not really operating in terms of money, <laughs> operating in the old way, but they're kind of a holdover from an earlier time. Hi, Dada. Hi sweetie pie. Right. Uh, well, I'm doing a lecture right now. Can you do it yourself? Yeah. All right, and in the towns, of course, we have uh, the burgers, as I call them, because I kind of want to, I kind of want to distinguish between burgers at this earlier stage of things and what will become the bourgeoisie at a later stage. But they're really, you know, those terms technically mean the same thing. But especially people who are thought of as burghers are the, the wealthy in the towns. And so you have bankers, you have people who are just speculating in the marketplace, you know, buying up, cornering the market on particular goods, like, you know, even like wheat or, um, uh, you know, barrels of beer or whatever the case may be and, and buying up a lot of stock and holding it just long enough till the price goes up and, and then make a killing on that. You know, that sort of thing is going on. Uh, master craftsmen who are operating like entrepreneurs um, and, you know, running their own business, but also working in the business. And, um, and I talked about master craftsmen and the apprenticeship and the journeyman and all that sort of thing in earlier lectures. Uh, and so we have wage earning journeymen who are also craft workers, but they do get a wage so that they can live on their own, as I discussed before. Other wage earners, servants, if you're a big wealthy banker or speculator, you're going to have a big house in the city or maybe even outside of the city, and you're going to hire a bunch of servants. Um, and of course, apprentices are almost at that level of serfs. Uh, and then there's maybe some other people, but these are largely the people that we're talking about. But we're going to have other people in there too. Um, okay, and then the origin of Parliament goes all the way back to the 13th century. Um, and uh, really, what I should have in here in 1215 is the Magna Carta, um, and that's that's an agreement originally made in, in 1215 between King John and uh, his mostly immediate vassals. So the, the larger dukes, things were a lot less organized at this point, but the larger dukes were basically operating independently, but needed to come together when they needed to fight off a con common enemy. Um, King John was using his authority over them uh, in ways that they found abusive. And so the Magna Carta was kind of an agreement to, to keep the peace. Uh, it was never fully implemented until uh, decades later, but then had to be like reaffirmed over the century and really doesn't become part of English law until the end of the period that I'm discussing in these, these series of lectures. So this is, this is the very beginnings, the inklings of the nobility 
becoming class conscious and fighting for power against the monarch and, and doing it in an effective way. And so in England, it just is a slow moving process. Um, I wanna say not as chaotic, but, but maybe that's just because with the English history, I'm a little more familiar. Um, but it's a slow moving process where little by little, this class of nobles, high ranking nobles, secure for themselves more and more stability in terms of power vis-a-vis -vis in relationship to the monarch so that they have some legal rights and they're not totally at the arbitrary whim of the monarch to you know collect taxes from them or to tell them well we got to go to war or to imprison uh, high nobility uh, this is these are things that john was abusing and and they had a, a civil war uh, about this. So Magna Carta was supposed to like calm things down and it did somewhat and it was held on to as a tradition, uh, but doesn't really become solidified in law until we pass through this English revolution that I'm, I'm gonna describe. Uh, the parliament now was just like with the diets of of Charles, the king would call a parliament, uh, like a parlay to talk, a talking session to talk about the affairs of government at a high level. What can we all agree to? What are your complaints? Can I address those complaints? Uh, here are my complaints to you high nobles uh, and clergy members. I need you to work on this for me, you know, and they sort of just have a, a, a diplomatic discussion um, called periodically whenever the king felt like it. Uh, but it became, began to be uh, standardized. And by 1341, there's actually two houses. There's an upper house of the House of Lords. Those are the high nobles who are elected. And, and, then, and then the House of Commons, who are high level commoners, like landed gentry, wealthy burghers in the towns, who then gets some representation in this parlay. Um, all right, so I, th I think uh, that's good. We'll just keep this one short and then I'll, I'll start uh, working on the Protestant Reformation in England. 